1 Samuel chapter 5. I've got a lot to get through this morning. And then Matt will lead us with the Lord's Supper. So 1 Samuel chapter 5 and chapter 6 this morning. And uh, yeah, I'll do something slightly different. We'll go through that entire two chapter section. It's all one piece. And, uh, and I'll try to make some lessons as we go through. I don't have a point one, point two, point three outline today. It's more narrative and flowing. And uh, we'll get through it. So we got to the end of chapter 4 where the wife of Phineas, Phineas' wife, don't know her name, uh, gave birth. And as she was giving birth, she was dying. And she cried out, the glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. All right, so let's look at chapter 5 and verse 1. When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, the old Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early the next morning, Behold, Dagon had fallen face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. I think we're supposed to laugh. This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod. And he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. Who's from Gath? Goliath. Goliath. So they brought the ark of, of the God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. This is the third place. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place, that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was heavy, very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Chapter 6. The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us with what shall we send, send it to its place? They said, If you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty. But by all means, return him a guilt offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand does not turn away from you. And they said, What is the guilt offering that we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden tumors and five golden mice. We're supposed to smile and laugh here too. Like, According to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. So you must make images of your tumors and images of your mice that ravage the land and give glory to the God of, the, of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand off from off you and your gods and your land. Why should you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts after he had dealt severely with them? Did they not send the people away and they departed? Now then take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows on which there has never come a yoke, and yoke the cows to the cart, and take, but take their calves away home, away from them, 
and take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart and put in a box at its side the figures of gold which you are returning to him as a guilt offering. Then send it off and let it go its way and watch. If it goes up on the way to its own land, to Beth Shemesh, then it is he who has done us this great harm. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by coincidence. The men did so and took two milk cows and yoked them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they put the ark of the Lord on the cart and the box with the golden mice and the images of their tumors. And the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh along one highway, lowing as they went. They turned neither to the right nor to the left, and the lords of the Philistines went after them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and when they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark, they rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stopped there. A great stone was there, and they split up the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the box which was that was beside it, in which were the golden figures, and set them upon the great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices on that day to the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines saw it, they returned that day to Ekron. These are the golden tumors that the Philistines returned as a guilt offering to the Lord, one for Ashdod, one for Geza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron. And the golden mice, according to their number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and unwalled villages. The great stone beside which they set down the ark of the Lord is a witness to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. Now, if that had been the end of the story, um, it makes sense. All right, we'd be quite satisfied, but it keeps going. Verse 19. And he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked upon, and by the way, the look there doesn't just mean a glance, it means they, they investigated, they, they opened it up, and whatever. They, 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 it, was, it was more than just a look, something was not right here. But they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 men of them, and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. Then the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And to whom shall he go up away from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kiraph Jerim, saying, the, the Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to you. And the men of kiraph Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Aminadab, Aminadab on the hill, and they consecrated his son Eliezer to have charge of the ark of the Lord. From the day that the ark was lodged at kiriath Jerim, a long time passed, some twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. All right, so keep your Bibles open in front of you. We'll try to go through this um, somewhat long narrative, right? And it is a narrative. It's, it's historical writing. Um, and as I noted... There is some humor in there. There is some Hebrew humor. What surprises me, though, is that you know, sometimes in a narrative, the writer will break in. He'll do what's called an aside, and he'll speak to the reader, and he'll make some comment, but in, in this passage, he doesn't do that. If it was me, I probably would, but I'm not the writer of Scripture. But you'd expect him to break in and say, wow, how, how foolish are these Philistines. How foolish and, and stupid are these Philistines who think that they can appease God with golden tumors and golden mice. I mean, they had heard of God. They knew the Egyptian events. They acknowledged that back in chapter 4 and chapter uh, 5 as well. This God who rescued his people out of Egypt. They knew how great he was, and yet they think they can appease him with golden mice and golden tumors. And although there's no commentary from the writer, I think it's very comical. I think there's humor here. And he doesn't stop to say, you know, my, 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 how foolish they are. But I, I don't think he wants to treat us like kids, like children. I think he wants us to read this and say, wow, this is really plain. Um, this is really silly what these Philistines were doing. 
Certainly, the Philistines are people who in some way understand that God must be appeased. And that's something. They, they know that sacrifices must be made, that sin must be atoned for. But sin comes into the world. And when it comes into the world, it twists us. And it makes us very, very foolish, as well as all the bad things that sin does. But it makes us corrupt. And he, he doesn't treat us like children here and say, do you get it? He allows the story to speak for itself as we see things unfold. And we say, my, 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 look where idolatry, look where sin, look where this leads. It's so foolish. How incredibly foolish is our sin. At the end of the chapter, in chapter 4, Phineas' wife is giving birth, and she hears the news that her husband has been killed, her father-in-law Eli has been killed, and, and most sad of all, the Ark of the Covenant has been captured. And she says, the glory has departed from Israel. And it's literally, if you look at the Hebrew wording, it's uh, the glory no more from Israel. And it's very, very sad, very tragic words. More true than probably anything that Phineas himself ever said in his lifetime as a, as a priest. His wife says this and then she dies. And the glory departs, not simply because the, the Ark of the Covenant is gone, but because God himself has withdrawn his presence, his, his living, preserving presence from his people. The ark, we said last week, was a symbol. It was a symbol of God's presence to bless and to preserve and to be with his people. But now the ark is gone, and it wasn't the capturing of the ark that left the people without the glory. It was because God had left the people you know, without the glory. He, he is the glory, and the ark is the symbol of that. And Israel, yeah, they're still God's covenant people, but they were a covenant people in rebellion, in disobedience against God. They're now under his just judgment. So what follows next then is this very strange tale. It should be quite strange to us in the 21st century, in our culture, in our, where, where we live. Um, it is striking. There's no mention of Samuel. Somebody asked me about that the other day. Um, we've had this big buildup about Hannah giving birth to Samuel and God raising up Samuel. And we've had um, you know, Samuel speaking to Eli, the words of God. And now all of a sudden he's disappeared, he's missing. He'll reappear in chapter 7. But what we have now is two chapters that really just focus upon what happened to the ark and what happened to the places in the land of the Philistines uh, when the ark was taken. And I think the writer wants us to step back and to see what's going on here in the big picture. We'll get to Samuel again, but the big picture here, we learned some, some great lessons. The Ark of the, of the Lord may well have been captured. You know, it's in Philistine territory. And God's people are fearful, and God's people are weak, and they're under the, the judgment of God. They're under his just judgment, and all that's true. But listen, the Lord of the covenant God Almighty, Yahweh, remains the same living, powerful, sovereign God, free God that he always was. And I think that's the big picture. That's the big picture we're seeing here. Things may be very frightful for God's people at this point, but God remains God. Amen? Amen. God remains God. He is still sovereign. He's still living. He's powerful. He's free, just as he always was. Do you get the lesson? Don't judge God by how things look right now. Don't judge God by your circumstances and the way things appear. That's the way the world judges things. The world says, oh, look at the cause of the church. Look at the cause of Christ. What's it see? It sees weakness. It sees defeat. It sees division and compromise, theological, moral compromise as well. And what conclusion does it say? Well, the gospel's been defeated. The church is so out of date. It's so old-fashioned. It's so yesterday. Those, those Christians, they're on the losing side. But don't judge the Lord by the way circumstances appear. The Lord is the living God. He will never for one moment be compromised. His purposes are never frustrated. Never, ever. God remains the, the free, living, powerful God of the covenant. Here's the psalmist. Psalm 135. Whatever the Lord does, 
He pleases, sorry, whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven, on earth, in the seas, and all the deeps. This is Psalm 115. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. Now listen, the same can be said for you individually in your life. Maybe a superficial look at your life says, well, things are going really bad. Maybe you're having trouble physically. Maybe it's something happening in your life. And it looks like defeat. And you might be saying, as you look at your circumstances, where is God? Where is my God? Has he, has he taken his hands off the wheel? Is he out of control? But I would encourage you with these words, that old hymn that we sometimes sing, judge not the Lord by feeble sense. Do you know this hymn? But trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Don't judge the Lord by your feeble sense, right? You're just human. You don't know everything. Don't, don't judge God by what you see around you. But trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. He's never frustrated. I am all the time. <laughs> Sometimes it gets me in big trouble. You too, I'm sure. Now, you don't have to use your imagination much to think how it would have been with the Philistines. How, in a way, circumstances, God's reputation has been trashed. You can imagine the Philistines getting together and they've captured the Ark of the Covenant. Can you imagine what they're saying to each other? What kind of a God is this Yahweh anyway? He was powerless to stop us from defeating his people, capturing his holy ark. What kind of a God is he anyway? He's obviously not up to scratch. He, he's obviously not like our God, Dagon. And I suppose that's how unbelievers today, as they look at the state of the church, they're thinking, what kind of a God do these Christians believe in? It's so old-fashioned. Let me answer that. We believe in the living God whose power is unrivaled. He is supreme. He's above all else in heaven and on earth. There is none like him. And our hope is in him, the one who is completely sovereign over all his creation. Amen? Yes. He does whatever he pleases. He does all his holy will, moment by moment, even if we can't see it, even if the world can't see it, our God is in control. Amen? Amen. So what these Philistines didn't know, what they couldn't understand was that it was Yahweh. It was his plan, his actions, to hand the ark over to the Philistines. It was his plan to have his people defeated in Israel. They didn't know that. We did. We've been reading the story in chapter 2. Here's the man of God in chapter 2. He says to Eli's house, your house, Eli, is going to be dropped low. You know, God's plan, his, his, his sovereignty... He's going to judge your family, Eli, chapter 2. Chapter 3, young Samuel's in bed. He gets this message from God. God says to Eli through him, there will be righteous judgment upon you, Eli, and upon Israel. And chapter 4, the Israelites were defeated the first time, and they say at the end, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? They were right. God had defeated them, but they didn't really... Um, change their thinking, their actions after that. So it's not that the Philistines are more strategic. It's not that they knew some special military moves that the Israelites didn't know. It was that God himself had handed his wicked and disobedient people into the hands of the enemies. So far from being weak and powerless, what happens to the ark as it comes into Philistine territory proves that God is in control. You follow? Proves that he's in control and that he's the living God. That's better. All right. It's a very remarkable thing to see the lengths that God will go through to humble his people and to judge them and then to bring them back up again. God will risk, if he can put it that way, he's not really risking, but from our point of view, it looks like risk to bring his people down that they might be brought up again. All right, so follow along as we walk through this unfolding drama. Verse uh, 1 through 5 of chapter 5, the ark is taken to Ashdod. I won't say much about it. Dad preached very well in this passage. If you, if you missed it, grab the, the videos or MP3s online. In verse 6, we read, The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod. They were terrified, and for good reason. Verse 6, 
He terrified them, afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. So what happens then? Well, they move the ark to Gath. And again, verse 9, same thing. The hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So what do they do now? Well, they think, let's try somewhere else. So the ark is taken to Ekron. My spell check, I'm saying Akron, like Akron, Ohio, but it's my spell check. It's Ekron. And the same thing happens in Ekron. There's a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of the Lord was very heavy there, verse 11. And in every place, Yahweh, the covenant Lord, the one who needs no one, the one who is independent and self-existing, gives demonstration after demonstration after demonstration that he is the true and living God. Let me just read a commentary here. This is, this is good. His words are better mine. Yahweh intends for his people to realize that unlike a battered Dagon, their idol, Yahweh doesn't have to have someone come and set him up again. He can fight the Philistines by himself. He doesn't need his people to cheer him on. He will bring back his ark all by himself. So we're seeing that God is self-sufficient, that he is supreme. He goes on. Don't begin to think, Israel, that you can manipulate the living God like a lucky charm for your own convenience. And don't begin to think that he needs you to support and carry him as if caring is need needing to be done. He will carry you. He will carry. That's our God. We don't have to lift him up and put him back in his place. He lifts us up and puts us in our place. Right? So the ark is brought into the temple of Dagon. It's a comical picture. Um, that's how we're supposed to read it. Not with a, but with a laugh. Like, look at this. This is hilarious. What idolatry does to people. And he, he falls down. There, there's, there's great, you know, in the Bible, there is great sarcasm in the Bible. You might not realize it, but there is. Usually about idols and idolatry. There is righteous, holy laughter. Example. This is off the cuff. Elijah, Mount Carmel. And they're all dancing around trying to get Baal to light the fire. And what's Elijah saying? He's probably gone to the bathroom. Call louder. You know, maybe he's on a journey. And we're supposed to laugh because that's how stupid idolatry is. Here's Dagon. Just hilarious. He's a fish idol. And he's brought down on his face before the ark. And what do they do? They have to stand him back up the next morning. They need to put their God back in his place. I mean, what kind of a God is that? <laughs> Some God, Dagon, he's a bit of stone. And it gets worse. It gets funnier. The next morning, Dagon's head, he's decapitated. It's gone. And his hands and his feet are gone. He's just a torso now. That's the kind of idol he is. And our God is kicking the godness out of their god, or however you want to put it, you know. He's our defeated god. He's not really defeated. He's defeating their victorious god. And it's meant to make, you know, these idolaters, they get a bit of wood, and with part of the wood, they use it for fuel to cook their dinner, and then the other part, they bow down to his idol. How stupid is that, Isaiah is saying? Dagon falls before the ark twice, he's decapitated, he's dismembered, he's a god who has to be put back in his place, and then the people of Ashdod, Gath, Ekron, are afflicted with these deadly tumors. Now, for years and years, I thought maybe hemorrhoids, because some people have said it's probably hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are really bad, I've heard, but they don't kill you, um, and there's a connection here with mice, with rats, if you look at this as well. So it could well have been the bubonic plague. You don't know, because the bubonic plague gives you swellings in your lymph nodes and things like that. It's very, very deadly. So God humbles them in this way. And having humbled his faithless people, he now humbles the enemies, the Philistines, who are face to face with his living presence and power. Now the issue is, the question is, what will they do? What will they do? Will they repent and cry out to God for mercy? Look at verse 12, chapter 5. The men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. 
So they cried out, that's great, they cried out, but it wasn't a cry of repentance. It was a cry of, go away, leave us alone, stop afflicting us. And that's what they do, chapter 6, they, they send the ark away. Uh, there's no turning to God, no, no humbling before him. When God meets us, and we meet him and his power, there's always two choices, two ways. We can say, go away. Leave me alone. I don't want to change my life. You're, you're upsetting my life. Don't get in the way of my life. Or we can say, secondly, Lord, what must I do to be saved? How can I trust in you and bow down and worship him? Remember when Jesus comes to the land of the Gerizines, and there's that man that has the many, many uh, possessions, demon possessions. He's demon-possessed. And he casts out those demons from this man and puts them in his right mind. And the demons say, put us into the pigs. And so Jesus does that, and the pigs run off the cliff and die. And then the people, instead of worshiping Jesus, they say, leave us alone. Leave our, you're, you're hurting our way of life. You're upsetting our lives. Uh, we don't want you here. And that's what the Philistines are doing here. They're coming face to face with the power of God. And instead of being humbled and crying out, they say, leave us. They devise a plan. What's the plan? Chapter 6. The Philistines go to their priest. They say, well, what can we do? They're told, a guilt offering. You need to offer something up to appease this God. And they make these images of the tumors. I don't know what they would look like that are broken out on their bodies. Images of the mice or the rats that had ravaged their land. And they do that. And they say, that will give God glory in some way. Now, I hear what you're thinking, because I'm laughing as well. You're probably thinking, this is so far-fetched. How ridiculous these people are to think that they could do this, and God would be appeased and happy. They do a bunch of things that God had not commanded them to do. And they invent a religion that's comfortable. It doesn't bring you, you know, to God to worship Him. People do that today as well. They invent religions that cost nothing. And you say, well, it cost them some gold. It's easy to put your hands in your pocket sometimes. It's a lot harder to repent and to turn to him. So they make these tumors and they send these cows off. And it's a, it's a mirac miraculous, right? So instead of bellowing for the cows, which would have been the natural thing and go back, they leave home these cows and they go straight for Beth Shemesh. And God again shows them, shows us his power and his presence. Sam read uh, from Luke chapter 9 about what Jesus says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Sometimes we think, oh yeah, I've got a cross. It's my uh, unruly kids or it's my loud neighbor. That's the cross that I have. Or it's my difficult spouse, or it's my hard job. That's the cross that I'm bearing. But Jesus is really saying, he's saying, unless every day of your life you're willing to be put to death for the, the sake of Christ and for the sake of the gospel, you know, you're not worthy to be my disciple. If, if you don't prize me more than you prize the things of this world, if you don't prize Christ more, then in comparison your life is worth nothing, you know. Um, you can't be my disciple. That's what Jesus means. So the Philistines offer this kind of easy religion. You know, they send off these cows, and the cows come, and the people of Beth Shemesh are reaping in the, in the wheat harvest. They see the ark, and they rejoice to see it, verse 15 of chapter 6. And the cart comes to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh, and it stops there. They, they take the, 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 the wood, and they split it up, and they put the ark beside the box that was beside the ark um, in which they had those golden figures. Verse 15. And they sat them upon a great stone, and the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices on that day to the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines saw it, they returned that day to Ekron. So the Philistines must have thought, oh, this is really good. It worked, and that's that. And they go back to their land. And if that had been the end of the story, we'd probably stand back and say, well, God showed them. 
that, that's the end of it. He showed them that he was the living God. They might not have, have had eyes to see it, but he, he certainly showed them. But then you have this final little paragraph, starting in verse 19, this postscript to the story. And he, God, struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 men of them, and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. The same words of Gath, Ekron, and the places in the Philistine territory. He struck them with a great blow. And that's something we don't expect. We said, what's going on here? Was their sin so great? What's the big deal? So they looked upon the ark. Was that so bad? At the end of the verse, just as the Philistines were struck with a great blow, God's people were struck with this great blow. Now, what's the writer telling us here? I think one thing is that God's no respecter of persons. He punishes sin wherever he can find it. And in looking at the ark in this, in this way, in, in some way that we're not told exactly, they were doing what God had told them not to do. And there's obviously no respect and no awe and, and uh, fear before God. And it's passages like this that make some Christians, even good Christians, say, well, how could God do such a thing? How could God punish what seems like a little sin so drastically? He's the good God, the just and righteous God. So they looked upon the ark. Uh, he, he struck 70 men dead because of that. And look at how the people of Beth Shemesh respond. Verse 19. The people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. Then the men of Beth Shemesh said, what they say? What kind of a God is this that he should deal so severely with us? Is that what they said? They said, look at your Bible. They said, who is able to stand before the Lord this holy God. And here's the thing. God alone is the judge of how wicked our sin is. The cross of Jesus Christ, like nowhere else, shows us how bad our sin is. More than Sodom and Gomorrah, more than Noah and his ark and the worldwide flood, the cross of Christ is where God really shows us how sinful sin is. We measure sin by, you know, what it does to us, what it does to our neighbor, what it does to the world, but not by what it does to God. Here comes Nathan the prophet. Remember this? Nathan the prophet confronts David. David's brought to repentance before God. He goes on and he writes Psalm 51. And you know this psalm. And he's got that verse, verse 4 in Psalm 51 that just hits between the, light, the eyes. He says, Against you, David says, against you and you only, God, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You say, well, hang on, David. Didn't you abuse Bathsheba? You abused your power over her. You ruined her life. You certainly ruined her marriage. Didn't you disgrace your family and her family? You conspired to have her husband killed in battle. You brought dishonor to the people of Israel and so much more. And David says, against you and you only have I sinned. If you ask David, he'd say, well, you're right. I really, really made a mess of it. So much more worse than you would think. But I've learned this, that the heart of my sin is not just what it does to my wife or to my family or to my people. It's what I've done to Almighty God. That's the measure of sin. Our, our thinking is so, so not God-centered. And the men of Beth Shemesh say, who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And we say, we can answer that. Who can stand before this holy God? No one. I can't. I'm not, I know about you. You can't either. I can't stand before this holy God. And yes, the New Testament says that God is a consuming fire. It also says that he's the God of mercy, the God of grace. He's the one who sings over us. He's the one who inhabits eternity. But he also is the one who is holy. And that's how we are to measure sin. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, that verse that we sometimes read, he says, do you know the reason why some of you have died in the church? It's because you treat the Lord's Supper with contempt. Some of you, Paul says, have had an early death because you treat the holy things of God lightly. What kind of a God is that? Well, he's the God of the Bible. 
He's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the God who loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son. The measure of sin is not the, the misery it's brought to this world, which is great, but the fact that it took the blood shedding of the incarnate God to pay for our sin, to deal with it, that's the measure of our sin. Puritans used to call it a day sidium, God killing, day sidium. God killing. You, you think about that when you're tempted? God killing. Do you think about that when you sin? If sin, if my sin would have its way, it's God killing. It's saying, God, I don't want you as part of my life. I'm going to go after these other things. I'm going to go after these idols. I don't want you to rule every time I sin. That's what I'm saying. Of course, we wouldn't put it that way. It's not very nice. But that's what we're doing. He is holy, and he brings his people very low to humble us and bring us to Christ. Bring us to Christ, that we might cry out to him. That's the reality that Samuel was raised in. He's speaking God's word to the people there to trust now in God, in, in, in his saving purposes. It's hard to keep going when God withdraws his, 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 the sense of his presence. That's really hard. But God's the God of glory. And in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're told in John 1, 14, he came and tabernacled among us. He tabernacled, he placed his tent among us. You say, well, then he went away, didn't he? But then Jesus said, I will pray to the Father and he will send you another counselor. The word other, there another, means another like me. The Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit. Luther called the Holy Spirit the other Christ. He didn't leave us. He sent us his spirit and we're joined to him forever. You think about this, you know, Jesus became human for us. He's the God-man. He, he's forever joined to the dust of this earth. There is dust right now sitting on the throne room in heaven. You, you think about that. He's forever joined to us, the Lord Jesus, the glorified dust of heaven. Who is like you, O Lord? We worship with holy fear, sometimes a joy unspeakable, full of glory that just can't be described in words and mixed with the truth that our God is a consuming fire. He is holy. And if not for Christ, if not for him, we've got no hope. So boy, these Philistines, or no, the people of Israel, they cry out, who is able to stand before the Lord? Who can stand? I can't. But I can through Christ, in Christ. I think that might be where Matt's going this morning with the Lord's Supper. Praise his name. Amen?